are so bright Pull your hat down, make sure your cinch is tight Horse is kinda snuffy, cold chill up your spine It'll get your ass moving some more burn on daylight Welcome to Burning Daylight, the only podcast for the working cowboy. Brought to you by Stetson Ranches out of Fromberg, Montana. Well, howdy there, Daylight Burners. Happy Monday. Hope the weekend treated you all right. I hope you, uh, I hope you got drunk as shit, honestly. I don't care. Um, if you didn't, well, eh, you're probably a Mormon. And speaking of Mormons... Uh, Scott Hall's back on the show. He used to be a Mormon, I think. Not anymore. Anyhow, we, uh, a good buddy of mine and, uh, had a good talk about horses and, uh, feral cattle and, uh, what it takes to be a good cow boss and, ah, we just talked. So anyway, uh, I think you'll like this one. Scott Hall's back on the show uh, and let's get into it. <laughs> uh scott i've got you recording right now since we we're, we're bullshit and we might as well record it so it's okay. I, i've uh i've got the setup now to where i can just plug my phone in and 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 record it so we're we're good well uh yeah that, that's what i do with boots every every time i call him so he knows it though. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah he does and uh but it, it's because I, you know, I, I was before I met him, I thought maybe I, I could get his uh, I could get one of those guys down at the four sixes to get him set up on Zoom. And I was going to send him a, you know, like a pair of headphones and whatnot. And uh, and then I went down and met him and I was like, yeah, there, there's no way. I just got to call him. That's I, I've either got to call him or I got to go do it in person because he's not going to learn anything new. Uh, he's just not going to do it. And and you know at his age, why would he? So so we've got it. Uh, I've got it set up to now where I can. Yeah, it's that's no problem. Any, anybody that I want to call, I can just I can plug in my computer and use my good microphone and everything and and get it you know where it sounds good. So. Well, that's good. That's good to hear. <clears throat> As I was sitting here, I was like, man, I was talking, I kind of woke up, you know? Yeah. They had overdone it on the other beach cobbler, and I was just like, I'm just jumping. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to have an intelligent conversation with a big shit one by the trucks. Well, the good thing about being a cowboy is uh, nobody expects an intelligent conversation from you, and and when they <laughs> when they get it, they're they're just plum tickled because they're like, oh, that guy, that guy cowboys, and they also he's pretty smart, so it's it's just a bonus. You know, all I ever knew about being a cowboy was I had to outsmart a cow. Yeah, 
And so I figured, hey, this is my, my kind of job there. And you always it's think they're pretty dumb, and they are to an extent. But boy, when they when they don't want to get caught or they won't don't want to do something, boy, they are very shifty. I'll tell you what, man, I I've, I've thought about this feral cow deal for a long time. Several years. And uh, when I met Melanie and she told me she where she was from. I was like, shit, they had a bunch of feral cattle and horses down that way. And I knew that there was laws, you know. Mm-hmm. I didn't know how many laws, and then I started finding out that the new tribe claims that everything that doesn't have a brand on it has theirs. <laughs> oh, no shit. So you're not just dodging the U.S. government on this dude, you're dodging the new tribe, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> like, really? How the hell are you supposed to get into it? And so, and it's, of course, you start to study it out a little bit, and you find out, well, there's, there's loopholes. Oh, yeah. A lot of these ranchers have been running in this country, too. 60, 70 years. And so really, most of those feral cattle come from their stock. Mm-hmm. So one group of people can't go in there and say, well, that's my cattle. Because truthfully, the feral cattle in this area come from Clay uh, McCaffney's and get first last name, but anyway, it comes out of their stock originally. Mm-hmm. Some of them might go back to their first. The new tribe won't come in and try to say, these are my cows. Because first of all, the biggest part of those cows that come from Earth, excuse me, Clayton Cat, and Earth. So they have rights to those cattle. Yeah. They, they know they can't gather them. It's just too tough to country. That's number one, it's straight up and down. And a lot of you know, Boom Rock, just ultra rugged country. And then there's brush everywhere that's, I mean, we're not just talking brush that's five or six foot deep, we're talking 20 foot tall old rushes. You know, how the hell do you find something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the best I could think is, you know, have a plane come in and drop an napalm. <laughs> <laughs> Agent Orange. <laughs> we we'll just go straight Vietnam on uh, on Western oh, Colorado, Eastern Utah. Yeah, that's a, that's the only thing I could think of. Because I was like, how in the hell would you get cattle out of that shit? You know, but uh, they don't. They just don't. They stay in there and then reproduce. And what started out as twenty five hundred cows is now two hundred head of cows. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and get them out of there, and the state wants them out. They wants them out. The U tribe wants to be able to claim something, but they can't because it's, you know, they got to cross play to get there. They can't get them out, you know. So I'm sitting here thinking, shit, maybe what a guy ought to do is a helicopter and come in and start guarding some of the bitches. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's one way to go about it for sure. Well, what do you, you figure? Bull that weighs 2,000 pounds, 50 cents a pound, it's a thousand bucks. Yeah. A calf, a calf that weighs 700 pounds, well, they probably a dollar seventy, probably going to be worth a dollar sixty because it's just shit. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to be able to get 900 to 1,000 bucks out of him. So every one of them meat prices was close to a thousand bucks somehow, right? Yeah. Probably going to end with that. Well, shit, Matt. If you could even offer the government, you know, pay me a thousand bucks a cow to get them out of there, because the government wants them out just as bad as anybody else does. Nobody wants them around. Mm-hmm. So one way or another, there's money to be made off of it. You just got to make sure you either you fly under the radar, do it illegally, or you go to the government and say, "Hey, I, I can't beat you. I'll join you." You know, mm-hmm. and so I've I've looked at it from both perspectives, honestly. So I figure if I can do it legally and make a living at it, why not? Try? Yeah. But if they're going to force me to do it illegally, fine. <laughs> there, there you go. I'll figure out a way. 
they're not going to know. They could, they might think they're really like Scott's doing something underhanded. I'd be like, catch me. <laughs> yeah. You know? Come and force it. Yeah. So that's, that's Super. funny you, you bring that up is there's a, uh, cause there's a lot of, there's a lot of shit here lately where everybody is like, well, all of a sudden it's going to be illegal to do this. And well, that might be true. You know, it, I get, shit, you go to New York City right now and if you don't, don't get a shot, it's illegal to go to a bar or a restaurant or a grocery store or whatever. But it's only illegal if they enforce it. And if uh, they don't enforce it, eh, how illegal is it? So I don't know. There's uh there's always loopholes. There's always loopholes. Yeah. Well I was I was talking to the brother in law of my with the DWR, I guess they call it. Mm. And he said he said, you know, they used to be the wild horse management area. If you got a horse out of there, yes, it's illegal. Now he said just a fraction of that little book that there is wild horse or you know, wild horse management. So the rest of it, those are considered feral horses. They're hmm. horses that people have turned out and they said, Can you catch those horses legal? And I was like, shit. You know, that's a whole different ball of wax now. Uh-huh. That means that you can actually go out and get those decent horses and turn them into something. And now you don't have to sit there and have a panic attack. Some fish and game warden is going to come along and sight you because you've got a wild horse. Because they're not wild horses. Yeah. They're considered feral horses. So, which is what all the sons of bitches are in the first place. Right. Mm-hmm. There is one of them across the U.S. that's a true wild horse. No, not, a, not anymore. No. Hell no. Just, no. And so what's what's to stop a guy from carrying a running iron and uh and just, you know, lighting a little sagebrush and slapping your own brand on him? I mean like is that legal? Probably not, but you got just oh, as much you. of a claim to that horse as uh, as the federal government does. Right, right. And once again, like I said, the new tribe is trying to say, Well, those are our horses. Well, really, they're not. Yeah. Because they're running on public lands. Mm-hmm. And you can prove that they're your horse as much as I can prove that it's my horse. So the only proof is that brand. But right. here's the thing. He's got your brand. Your trespass, right? Oh, <laughs> so, that's where so they get you. That's, that's where they would get you is what my brain is saying. Because so just what? like if you... If you're running your cows on somebody else's BLM, yeah, that's kind of awesome, right? Yeah. So, so the, what, what's the what's the penalty for trespassing? I don't know what the true penalty is necessarily, but if I was going to gather up these shitters off the off the foot of this, I just catch them, corral them, and then brand them and keep them. Yeah. You know. That's legal as can be because really, you caught him. He is a feral horse. You brand him now. He's your horse. Mm-hmm. Now you can do with what you, you can do with him whatever you want because he's yours, right? Mm-hmm. You can I, keep him in the corral. You just can't turn him back out because now he's your horse. Mm-hmm. You can keep him back out on purpose. Yeah, you're kind of trespassing. You yeah, know, I think it's. I don't know if you could get in any trouble for it because, like you said, people are turning out horses all the time because, well, the wild horses are so bad. Yeah. So what if the wild horses are starving? Yeah. I, so, we should we should preface this by saying that this is a comedy podcast, so everything you hear here, Mr. NSA agent, uh, has to be taken with a grain of salt because it is a comedy podcast. So, uh, just, just, to, you know, just so we're, we're, uh, we're above board here. We're, we're simply speculating. Absolutely. S- simply speculating. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it's not like, it's not like we've ever caught any of these horses. 
Right. right. And, and, you know, this is America still somewhat. And, and we, we, we still, as far as I know, have a, a right to speculate on stuff. So it's a comedy, yes. it's a comedy podcast. So, uh, lay off us. Well, something too, you need to think about, and this is, this comes up in every wild horse, uh, thought that you had, all right? You're riding a horse right now. Mm-hmm. These, these good saddle horses, especially ranch and cowboy horses, probably are worth over $20,000 a piece, right? Probably, yeah, yeah, in today's market for sure. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're worth a pile of money. Yeah. So you think about running horses in rocks and, I mean, horrible rough country. What are your chances of crippling that expensive horse so that you can catch a horse for the simple fact that you might be able to get a thousand bucks out of it? Yeah, maybe. 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 Without so spending a ton of time on them. I'm like, if you spend a bunch of time on them, you might be able to get what? Twenty five hundred, three thousand on them. If you spend yeah. a lot of time on them, right? More so than mm-hmm. yeah. You know, I had uh, this kid that was working up with me this weekend. He's he's thinking, man, there's some really cool looking wild horses out here. Wouldn't it be fun to catch one? And I said, look, I said that horse you're riding right there. I said I just barely got him sound from the last week that he rode, two weeks ago, and I said. You go and try to run down a horse on him. You cripple him for good. I said, that colt that you're looking at is a, a yearling colt. I said, you catch that son of a bitch and you cripple that horse. You cost me fifteen to $20,000 so that you catch a horse that's worth nothing. Mm-hmm. It's a baby. And you don't know if it's inbred. You don't know if you're going to be able to get anything done with it. Right. I said, if you're going to do it, do it on your time and do it on your horse, you know? Yeah, and that's the thing about those uh, those horse Karens uh, that really love the Mustangs and whatnot. They love them to a certain dollar amount, and then after that, they don't particularly love them so much anymore. They're not going to they're not gonna spend that money on them. So, they, they might yeah. bitch about it. They, and they they might they might be on your side until you ask them to, to put some money up, and then yeah, that after that, not so much. Right. Yeah, I I can see a place for horses like that. I mean, to me, where I'm working in a certain set of the mountains, it's pretty rugged and pretty tough. So I'm not going to feel too bad about it. even if I was to go over to uh, Steve Mantle down in Wyoming. Say, hey, I need something that I can go ride rough country on and have it be tough, and I'm not going to feel bad if he if he comes up lame every now and then, you know. Mm-hmm. But those horses have that line of breeding where they they were raised on deserts, you know. They have spent their entire life in that rough country, and you can cowboy on them in really really rugged country. Yeah, they're they're still going to come up lame once in a while. Yeah. Shoot, I got this old bay horse that I've been riding for the last, gosh dang, I've been riding him since he was two. He's only eight. And because of all the cowboy and rough country that I've done, some of the gun's eight years old, and I'm worried that he might be crippled for good. Yeah. You know, at eight years old, and that son of a gun bred up. I mean... His granddaddy's a world champion calf roping horse. His dam is a, I think she was running almost second in the world in reigning. You know, that's the way this horse is bred on top and bottom both. Yeah. And it's, son of a bitch. Just for the sake of cowboy, you know, chasing cows and, you know, doctoring baby cats. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's nice to have a nice horse, but shoot, I could have made a pile of money off him before he started coming up lame. Mm-hmm. Now he's just another old <laughs> hay burner, <laughs> right? Yeah, like once they once they stop being valuable, there. I mean, that's all they do is just they just cost you money. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I'm I'm hoping that I can get him healed up. You know, but what if I don't? Right. And we 
<clears throat> you know, any old cowboy, you know, any good cowboy, I'd, I should say, any any good hand loves their horses just as much as the next, uh, you know, fat middle-aged Karen that, that thinks they're the God's gift to a horse. We all love them, but we also mm-hmm. have a little bit of common sense and we realize that, yeah, once that horse can't go out and do the job that we want them to do, <sighs> that, that there is nothing that they can do except cost us money. Yeah. That, I mean, and that's the that's the truth of it. And we don't make that much money. So, right. Once they cost start costing you money, they uh down the road they go. I mean, that, that's just how it yeah. is. That, that's where I I kind of been looking at this set of horses that I'm seeing every day as I'm out there living in camp, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think I'd lots rather be riding something that has spent their whole life in shit. Yeah. And and they've they've kind of weeded out the, the junk, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you you do see a few of them that are ranch horses that people have turned out, but there's a quite a number of them. As you see them running across them rocks back and forth up and down these rips. It's like, hey, that horse is going to be able to take this abuse. Yep. And where I don't got to pay a bunch of money for them, maybe I could use that some. Yeah. So that's crossed my mind a bunch, but I'm like, man, the time, the time it takes to get them some of the guns going and the effort to catch them. Yep. And the, the, the horse that I'm riding is highly valuable compared to them. It's, it's It's sixes whether or not I ride out there and catch them or if I just say, you know what, it ain't worth it. Yeah, I'll just you know go to Steve Mann or go to somebody like that who's turning out wild horses that uh, you know they're starting them. They've got I think there's some kind of an adoption fee, but at least it's an inexpensive horse that's got some good flat bone on him. He's got some good hard feet. You know, honestly, Matt, I cowboy on three different wild horses right now. Yeah. Um, one of them's a half breed, but the other two are full bloods. And as far as working in this country goes, I don't feel a bit bad for them because these horses handle it. You know, yeah, They're not very big. It's not the kind of stuff you'd rope a bull off of. I mean, the one horse probably weighs nine hundred pounds. I mean, she'll go all day, mm-hmm. but she ain't big enough to rope big stuff off of. And then the other one, he's he's not much bigger than her. But I'll tell you what, he'll go all day in that rough country. Yeah. <clears throat> Just dirty dog tough. And he's ugly as sin. Oh, yeah. You know, that, he's got that ugly shitter head on him. You neck and, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he just, he's just never going to be pretty. He's got the rafter ass, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he's, his feet almost seem too big for his legs. Yeah, I've got but, one just like it. Uh <laughs> Rainbow Dash. Rain, Rainbow Dash. Yep. <laughs> Big old you neck. Uh, you, you about need a draft uh, head stall to, to fit her head. She, wear, <laughs> she wears a number two shoe and, and, yeah. she, and she weighs right in at a thousand. Probably a thousand. <laughs> uh, she, yeah. looks, she looks huge looking at her. And then, then you go to cinching her up and she, you know, she wears the same same girth as my my 14 hand little karen mare <laughs> and you're just like but you can't cripple her you can't kill her i've tried and it just don't work uh, she also you can't get her to slide to a stop either she'll just uh, like i and i've actually tried it with a spade bit just just to see what it what would happen and she shakes her head just like she does with a snaffle just like puts her head up in the air and shakes Shakes her head around with a spade, and you're like, "God, that has got to hurt like a son of a bitch." But well, uh, we had some uh, difficulties of the technical sort, and um, yeah, give me a break. We're a couple of dumb cow hands trying to figure out technology. Anyhow, sorry. We missed that one. Hey, sorry to interrupt the show. I know it's a good one, 
but I got some people that uh, that help me keep this thing going every every week and uh, and bringing great content to your ears. So let me tell you about them. First off, we got Stetson Ranches out of Fromberg, Montana, the multi generational ranch uh, family focused on the things that really matter in life: horses and cattle. They got some of the best beef coming to you uh, if you're in the northwest uh, part of the country. So Montana. Colorado and over um, nationwide shipping's a disaster right now. So, uh, but if you're, if you're in the, the Pacific Northwest or, or you know, I, I guess like the, the mountain mountain West region, um, you're good to go. And, uh, and this is some of the best beef you'll ever meet, uh, ever eat some of the best people you ever meet. Um, but it's USDA prime delivered to your doorstep on dry ice. It's uh six ninety five a pound if you want to do a, a quarter or an eighth or they got a cool sub uh, subscription program it's uh between eight and eleven pounds of beef every month uh, one hundred twenty five bucks a month that's uh, hamburger stew meat uh roasts uh, and various uh various cuts of steak great deal Tina also has some of the best uh brood mares around with uh bloodlines going back to foundation quarter horses like uh, Zanfar Bar, Two Eyed Jack, Peppy Sand Badger, Doc Bar, just to name a few. They they just picked up a new stud who is a uh, grandson of uh Peppy Sand Badger and uh, Doc Alina. They've got all their mares bred to a ranch from the King uh King Ranch um bred to a stud from the King Ranch out the uh, foal crop coming this spring. They're going to be big, shapey, athletic, and uh, ready to go any direction you want to them. They want to want to take them. They're going to have a great mind to them, great disposition. Just just the type of horses you want. Anyways, great people. And if you'd like to know more about them, you head over to StetsonRanches.com to check out their horses. Uh, StetsonBeef.com to... Uh, check out the the beef and order and also jesse is uh making custom knives um because you know i don't know what these what these folks don't do I and mean, they just do it all and and jesse's uh, bringing bringing you some of the best uh handmade knives on, on the market today they're really 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 nice um so anyway go go follow him on instagram at stetson forge uh, next up, we got Tracy Morrison, custom silverwork. Tracy's a hell of a guy. He's out of uh, Chelsea, Oklahoma, and uh, he's building cool shit for the working cowboy, whether it be uh, buckles, bits, spurs, um, conchos, just any of that type of stuff you think you might want. Uh, give him a holler, and he can help. Uh, he can hook you up. He's uh, he built a pair of spurs for uh, for a raffle for us, and they are awesome i mean just really really nice and uh, so if you'd like to get in on that it's 50 bucks a ticket well a, por- a portion of the proceeds will go to the veteran farmer coalition uh, a charity organization that helps uh veterans get started on their own farm and ranch so anyways it's 50 bucks uh, a piece there's 50 spots open and uh, well 50 spots total not 50 spots open yet we still we got a couple people that uh already signed up but uh you can shoot me a message if you'd like to uh get entered up in that it's uh you know they're they're really really nice so uh you get a, a chance at at some really cool spurs for not a whole lot of money anyway you can find tracy on facebook and instagram just uh search him up it's tracy uh, t-r-a-c-i-e tracy morrison custom silver work uh, great guy building cool stuff for the working cowboy at working cowboy prices. So check him out. And then last but not least, we got cardomax.com. This is a, uh, supplement supplement company that I use, uh, quite a bit. And, uh, you know what? I'm going to blame them because they were out of stock for the, the immunity booster that I normally drink every day. And that's probably why I got COVID. But guess what? They redeem themselves. They're back in stock and it's, it's really good stuff. It's, uh, it's just stuff. They got, um, some, uh, they've got an energy booster. 
which is kind of like a pre-workout or just a cup of coffee if you need to accept it tastes uh it tastes great that's uh and i like coffee too but this stuff is like uh like an energy drink without all the bullshit and then uh they make a recovery drink but the one that i really use uh religiously is their immunity booster and that's just to help uh strengthen your immune system which we all know we can do uh, so anyway, head over to cardomax.com, uh, use a promo code, move your ass, M O V E Y E R A S S. And that'll get you 10% off, uh, your order. It's a great, great product, uh, veteran owned and operated by a Navy seal. So it might make you superhuman. I, I can't verify that, but anyways, um, check them out. Cardomax.com promo code, move your ass. Yeah, let's get back into the show. So anywho, um, I'm telling you about that horse in the Binion Ranch. He was a dirty, good-looking thing. Kind of a about a 15-hand tall, great big, pretty hip on him. Mm-hmm. Just kind of put together, you know. And uh, I traded for this horse. I had a pretty damn nice spade bit horse that I'd made. And traded for that gray son of a gun, thinking, here's a real cool-looking horse that'll be just spiffy, you know. And I, I thought, Heck, I'll get him really handling, you know. At, at that point, I'd made a couple of horses, and I thought, hey, we'll make him a horse, you know. Oh, yeah. But somebody had fouled up his stop, and he would prop set, and you could not get him to get it in the ground. Mm. You, you could get him to kind of turn right, but, man, as far as his stop, it was blowing all the hell. And I never did get it back. And then I, when I got my one horse back from Montana this last spring same deal his, his stop had been blown on the hill and you know you cannot get him to stop on his hind head I don't know if he just got stopped in the rocks a few too many times or what but there's no bringing it back yeah as there's something about that though when and I, I've noticed that in the feedlot too like there's it's not rocky but it gets hard you know you get that hard pan and, yeah. and you get them stop, you know, stop on the ass in one time on that real hard ground. And man, it just, they don't like it. <laughs> they, they just don't like it. I don't, I don't know. I think it just hurts them. Yeah, I think so. And they, yeah. they, yeah. they're like a woman. They got a long memory. <laughs> you know, man, I'll tell you what, that's, that's no lie. They don't, they don't get over it. I, I've not seen one that gets, that back after they've burned their hawks. That's that's what they always told me it was called, was burning their hawks. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. Once it's happened, you just, well, it, that's the way he is, and he'll never be the same again, and just move on, you know? Yeah. And, and most of those horses will still get themselves stopped in a pretty decent way. You know, they can really get the brakes put on, but they just don't ever feel good under you. No. And then when, when they get to stopping hard on that front end, man, it's, I mean, it hurts, you know, like if, if you're really going at something and they, they go to stop on that front end and poof, you, yeah, that, you really wish they hadn't. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why that is, but, uh, well, when them shoulders hit you and, it just smacks you every time. Every time. It's like, it's like hitting a brick wall, huh? Yeah. I, and I don't know. It just, and you, you try, like you try to, to get them to lift up on those shoulders and they just, they don't, I don't, I don't know what it is. They just don't. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's like I say, what's kind of funny about this little brown Mustang is he's, he's one of them that he won't really, he won't prop set. You know, on that hard ground, though, you can tell that he just kind of, he's just kind of careful. Like he knows the difference between one piece of ground and another. Yeah. And man, in the dirt, I've had him sit down and really get deep. And you're like, no way, that son of a bitch can get in the ground. (laughs) Yeah. He he looks like, he looks like something out of a cartoon, you know? (laughs) Yeah. And, of course, Melanie, she thinks all them, she, she likes the old school looking horses, kind of like out of the Will James books, you know? Yeah. And so she thinks he's cool looking, but I'm like, oh, man, give me a nice plump, 
big ass quarter horse. That's what I like. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the same way. Yeah, I was raised in a family with really fancy quarter horses, and I like a big mm. hip and a pretty face. You know? <laughs> I'm the same way. We had a bunch of. Uh, Let's see. Well, my my dad's mares were all Leo and uh, Go Man Go. Just about all of them, or Poco Bueno, Go Man Go, Leo. That was that was what my dad liked, and you know, just good, yeah, good fast cow horses is what what we had. Yeah, and that's the way to have. Them. I've I've always liked a horse that can really run hard. Yeah, I don't know. I I guess when I was a kid, I had a kind of a racehorse bred outfit. He was a tonal moon time. Uh, I think they call it tonal bars or something like that. And man, that sucker could carry the mail. And when he would move, he was super soft and super smooth. Had a little bit of a nice hip, not real, not real big, but he was just good headed, long legged, you know, mm. just a good buckaroo kind of horse. And, Son of God, I love that little pony. Probably about 17 hands tall. Mm-hmm. And just, just a little feller. Little feller. Yeah, yeah just a little guy. <laughs> and he was fast. And I kind of got addicted to that speed, you know. Oh, yeah. Gosh dang, after that, I didn't like anything that was slow. And, I uh, believe you. You know, you get on those. Them old Spanish ranch horses, a lot of them were thoroughbred. And so I I went from that little tunnel moon time horse to the thoroughbred horses on the span. The, the thing is, they had that uh, swamp fever in those horses. Oh. And so, shit. No, I mean, no. They could run what fast that? for a little bit. That's that uh, Coggins. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's passed by mosquitoes. Huh. And so when they, you know, it, even if you get it cleared up out of a bunch of them, you've got the mosquitoes in that area, and they'll just pass from horse to horse to horse. Uh, yeah, so it's you, you have to get rid of all the horses. Mm. That's, the only, that's why Ira got rid of all those Spanish ranch horses, because they had Coggins and all of them. Mm, that's so no when, when people talk about the bad Spanish ranch horses, they don't have the bad strain of horses that they used to. They don't have the real cranky horses they once had. This is all new horses now. Uh, I see. They have new bad horses. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I don't know what kind of horses I runs now, but when I was there, it was some pretty nasty old crosses. You know, a lot of them were thoroughbreds. A lot of, uh, not a lot, but quite a few Appaloosa horses. Mm. And then, um, I think we even had a few wild horses in the bunch. Okay. Now, yeah. where where exactly is the Spanish ranch? Like, that, I I've listened to you you talk about it quite a bit, and uh, and I, I know several other people that have, have talked about it, but I, I I'm just I'm not from the Great Basin area, so I, I just don't know. Okay, so there's a little town, an old old mining town, north of Elko called Tuscarora. Okay. And so as you're going up the valley from Elko, like you're heading to uh, Wild Horse, Nevada. Okay. You come to cross over the, I think it's the Independence Mountains. You drop down the other side. There's kind of a, it's kind of higher desert. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't say come on, it is. It is, it is high desert and a uh, little bit colder country. There's a place called Jack Creek. Okay. Yeah, Jack Jack Creek up there before you drop down. I think that's the Independence Valley that it sits in. So you're like, it's like west of Montello. Let's see. Montello. Montello. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Montello is the one that's the wine cup. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it's damn sure west of Montello. So you, okay, so you've got the highway going from Twin Falls down to Wells. Yes. And then you've got the highway going from Mountain Home straight south to Bruno. Well, not straight south, but it goes southwest to Bruno. Mm-hmm. 
and then from Bruno to Grasmere, then from Grasmere it goes to Riddle, Owyhee, and then keep going south from Owyhee to Wild Horse, or rather Mountain City to Wild Horse. And then from Wild Horse, there's not much else until you get to Elko. Okay. All right. So so, so there's that highway. It's west of that highway. Okay. So, so so you're you're more towards the like the Oregon side of uh of of like northern Nevada. Yeah, you're getting closer to it, but it's not quite that far over. Yeah, it, it's not it's not over into Oregon, but you're get you're like I, I would say like from Elko is kind of like the center point where you go from either you know west of Elko, you're headed towards Oregon, or east of Elko, you're headed towards Utah. Yes. Okay. Yes. I got you. Yeah. Basically, you go straight north out of Elko, and then that takes you up towards uh, Tuscarora. Okay, but, that makes sense. That makes sense. But, I, yeah, if, you, if, if you're at Tuscarora, it's well. It used to be you'd cross the mountains from Tuscarora mm-hmm. to get them into Midas, Nevada. Okay. So Midas was part of Ellison's holdings as well. Not Midas, but uh, Squaw Valley. Oh, okay. Did you so hear that Valley. they're going to change that name? No way. Yeah, I heard that the other day. They're going to change the name mm-hmm. of Squaw Valley. Oh, my gosh. Uh, that's the world we live in nowadays. Yeah, that's... That's sad. You know, but anyway, but you know why? Is because we have to get rid of all the Indian women. That's that's why. Well, I mean, for, have for you ever been for, around? Me? I was married to an Indian woman. And I can see why we need to get rid of. <laughs> <laughs> I've never never been around a whole lot of them, so I I I, I don't have any experience. But I, I will take your word for it. Uh, you know, and, and you know, just like that's. For equality's sake, we got to get rid of the the Indian women. So Squaw Valley is no more. Well, I mean, you know, if you if you knew how crazy this woman was that I was married to, you you'd ride outlaws for the rest of your life. <laughs> you stay away from this woman. I'm not kidding you. Well, I've I've been around a handful of uh, of Indian fellas, and they're they're sure enough some some wild, crazy sons of bitches, like like good guys, <laughs> but like wild. I thought I was I was a pretty pretty much a wild man back in my in my college days, but man, I didn't hold a candle to some of these guys, and uh, so I, I can only imagine the the squaws. I I, I can only imagine. Oh my gosh. So I had a I had a full crew of Indian cowboys over there on the Crow Reservation, mm-hmm. and from the oldest one to the youngest one, they were all saddle bronc riders. Okay, yeah, they were the real bird family, and every one of them was bronc riders at one point or another, and uh, and I mean good bronc riders. Some of them was well, the one Kennard, the one that taught me to engrave. He was a world champion bronc rider. Mm-hmm. And then Paul, who I told you about the other day, shit, he's a bronc riding fool and dirty tough. Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, when he was, uh, that's one of the reasons he's still on the Crow Reservation is he kind of feels like it is his duty to clean up all the riffraff mm-hmm. and get rid of all the dirty politics in that situation. Which I know, know sounds like a little bit of an odd way for a wild buckaroo to go, but this guy. I would say good luck to him because, uh, man, <laughs> dirty politics is dirty politics no matter where you're at. The, you know, the stories he's told me about the dirty politics in the Crow tribe, it's, it's so ugly. I don't even want to say it in this conversation. Yeah, no, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. I've it's, I've had some of those conversations myself, and uh, yeah, you, it's stuff that you're like, no way, really. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, people would do that, you know. Yeah, I've I've got a I've I've got a fella that's uh, uh, what's his, his Jeremiah Wilbur. He goes uh, 
He goes by Jeremiah Blackbeard. He's got one of the most immaculate beards you've ever seen in your life. And, oh yeah. Uh, and he's uh, his his mother was uh, Mescalero Apache, and, and he was uh, special forces. Spent a lot of time over in Afghanistan. Like a, he's a bad motherfucker. Like a real like, <laughs> like a, he's he's an one of the most intense guys I've ever met. Uh, but a really good guy, and so. I'm going to I'm going to have him back on here soon uh kind of when the the packing season's over but he's he's going to come on and talk about um about some of the, just the the human trafficking that goes on uh on on the res and and, and particularly with the uh, with the girls like the Indian girls and it, I mean it's it just makes you it's it's one of those stories that makes you really lose faith in humanity. Yeah, that that's exactly what the kind of stuff Paul has told me over the yeah. last year. You know, he says that's why he feels like he needs to stay there. Yeah, and and, it, and it's and it's not just an Indian or, or a native deal. I mean it's like the, the corruption goes deep, 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 deep. Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah. So anyway, like uh, we, we don't need to go off onto that. I guess. I was, <laughs> right. um, but yeah, like, like we were saying though, it's just like the, the corruption knows no race or, or uh, ethnicity. I mean, like the, the corruption is corruption. That's, that's all, all there is to that. Yeah. It's, it's just really, ugly. and I, I commend Paul for staying in the fight, you know, and, mm-hmm. I mean, the guy, he's still buckaroo, and, you know, that's all, all he really loves to do is be a horseback and rope yeah. shit. But uh, he feels like it's his duty to stay in there and keep fighting for what's right. You know? Well, good on him because they're just, yeah, that, that, those are the type of people we need. Right. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's a cool dude. I don't know if you've had a chance to talk to him yet. I told him, you know, that you might that he might get a call sometime, but, um, you know, he can tell you some pretty good stories about bronc riding. And well, I'd love to talk to him sometimes. I'd love yeah, to. Man. You'll have to, you'll have to shoot me his number one of these days and we'll, uh, I'll see if I can, I can talk him into it. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I, I met another guy you got to visit with too. He's, uh, he's an old packer. He used to pack for the forest service, wasn't it, Melanie? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he'd pack for the Forest Service. And he worked for him for quite a few years. And uh sounds like he's had some pretty damn good wrecks and mm-hmm. got some good stories. And he's a good storyteller. There now, you I've go. Been, I sit and talk with him for, gosh, hours over the last couple of days. And I'm, I didn't really know the caliber of a packer this guy was. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he'd spend a lot of time in the back country and trying to get along with bad mules and bad horses. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I gotta go, I gotta tip my hat to uh oh uh well I, I know her as Erin Franks, uh then she was uh, I guess her name now is Erin Martinez, but I I went to the school with her up at CSU, but she's the one that put us in in touch and uh and she uh I've always liked her. Oh yeah. And she said, You need to talk to Scott Hall. <clears throat> he he can tell a story. So if you're if you're telling me a guy can tell a story, like I know I need to call that guy. Because oh, yeah. uh, when when Aaron told me like she because Aaron can tell a pretty good story. And yeah. but she's like, No, if you if you want you want somebody who'll talk and tell a story, here's here's this guy. You need to call Scott Hall. And boy, she was right. And now it's amazing. Uh, I've told people several times, like we, we talked to each other for <sighs> close to two hours. The first time I ever, I uh, ever called you. And, uh, and then ever since then, like if, if you're calling and if I, and if I don't have an hour to talk, I just don't, I don't answer. <laughs> and, and, there, and, there, and there's no, like, it's, it's nothing against you. It's just like, no, I don't have time because if, right. if, if Scott's calling, I need an hour at least. Because yeah. once once we get going, we don't stop, and uh, <laughs> you know, and it's just how it is. And it's like you're one of the few people where I've I've been able to do that over. Like I don't, 
I don't particularly talk to people very well over the phone. Usually my, my conversations are on the phone are just like, um, yeah, hey, what's going on? This is what, this is what I was calling you about. And, uh, have, have a good day. See you later. And that, that's kind of how my, my, my phone conversations go, except for a handful of people. And yeah, and if I don't have an hour to, to kill, I, I don't answer your phone call. I'll text you and be like, Hey, I'll call you back later because I know if you're calling, we're going to talk. So, uh, Aaron, Aaron Martinez was a hundred percent right on this one. <laughs> well, Hey, like I said, I'll, I'll get you this other guy's number. This is actually my wife's brother. And, oh, heck yeah. Uh, he is a good egg. He really is. And I, like I told you earlier, I told him, I said, as far as I'm concerned, he is as underemployed as he can be. Yeah. Because, I mean, he, right now he's a, he's just a handyman. Yeah. I'm not, nothing against a handyman. Don't all you handymen out there take offense. But a man who knows how to pack horses and, I mean, this guy has had 50 plus mules in a string. Mm. Now, that means he probably didn't see the back end of that pack string the whole time he was pulling it. You know what I yeah. mean? As, as he was leading it. He never saw the back end of that son of a bitch. 50 horses long. 50 plus. Yeah. A lot of mules, man. That's a and lot of a shit. That's a lot of shit you're packing up there, too. I mean, because a, right. a mule carries a lot of weight. They do, and, and not only that, but a lot of them don't have very good weathers on them. No. And the son of a bitch and packs will tilt sometimes. He told me he went three years without tilting a pack. Oof. Three years. I, I don't know. That might be some kind of record. That's <laughs> got to be. I'm in, But you, do, you don't want to bring the, the Guinness Book of World Records guy out there because, you know, something might, you know, <laughs> he, he's probably going to fuck something up and, and – you know, once you tip one pack, then the next one's going to tip, and then you know, then you got fifty in a string that's going to tip, and you, you can't have that. Right. When he told me he had had a, a string that long and had success with it, I was thinking, you know what? I've had eighteen head in a string one time in my life, and I was scared to death. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And uh, this guy knew. I mean, he knows his stuff. And so he's kind of fun to talk to uh, once you get him going. Yeah. So I'll, I'll get you his number. Perfect. His name's, his name's Josh Christensen. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, he he emails me every now and then. I'll, uh, I'll email him back. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. He's a good yeah, because where I grew up, we did we didn't have to pack shit, you know, because you could you could watch your dog, you know, it's the old prairie uh, saying you could watch your dog run away for five days. <laughs> and so you didn't you didn't have to pack anything, you know. <laughs> like yeah. there, if you, you just if you had a any sort of wagon, you could just pack it as as, as uh, or just load it as as much as you could until the until the wheels broke, and then you'd you'd, you'd take five pounds off and then fix your wheel, and you'd, you'd be good to go. Uh, yeah. We we didn't have to do any pack animals, you know. It was. Uh, just yeah, it, we didn't we didn't have to worry about that shit. But uh, up in the mountains, I like I I, I kind of live in the mountains now, but I'm a flatlander through and through, and uh, and so I like I always, you know, I I tip my hat to anybody that's got to, especially like those guys that got to go up to cow camp and and pack salt and everything. That's that's just one more aspect that you got to do to be a cowboy, you know. It, when you when you got to pack your shit in, that's uh, yeah, that's, that, that's another level of cowboying that you got to do. Well, you know, there's some guys they spend their lives doing that, and they get so that they can practically do it blindfolded. You know, mm -hmm. and he's one of them guys at one time. I mean, he was he was one of the best out there. It's the same old story, you know. They they promoted some other dipshit, and it pissed him off, and so he quit. That's and, that's the cowboy story if I've ever heard one. Right? It's I mean it's the story <laughs> for, of all of us. Yep. You know, like when I was the reason I left the Spanish ranch is because they promoted some dickweed that come along and he was on crack. He was fucking on drugs and so he could outwork everybody. Well yeah, so for a little while until that shit, until that shit wears off. Yep. 
And you know, once he got the Cowboys, everybody hated him. Yep. I mean, absolutely hated his guts. And, and the thing is, he didn't know the country. He didn't know all the horses. And they made him the cow boss. And I was like, you got to be shitting me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I quit, you know. But he'd and, work like a motherfucker when he was on the yeah. shit. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've yep. known a few of those guys, too. You know, I, I yeah. think... uh I, I, I've thought about this a, a bunch of times because I've been in the in the position where where once once you make that that leap from uh, like top hand into cow boss, I, I, I don't want to say that's the death of you being a cowboy, but like it's the beginning of the end because once you become cow boss, you're not really one of the guys anymore. And, uh, right. and there's, you got to figure out how to handle that. And yeah. cause it's a, it's a very, it's a very thin line that you got to walk because you still want to be one of the guys, but you've got a hell of a lot more responsibility than the the rest of the guys. And, yeah. uh, and, and how, how you walk that line, a, it says a lot. And, and, you know, because there's, I, I'm sure you, you know, you've been around longer than I have, and and, and been on on some sure enough cowboy crews, uh, you know, where where you get you get a sure enough good hand that that gets promoted to cow boss, and then all of a sudden they don't know how to handle the responsibility, and or they don't know how to juggle that, uh, holding the crew as and uh, and holding the responsibility, and that that's. I don't know. I, I'm going to do a whole episode on that one of these days about like one, once you cross that line, that that's uh, you know what I mean, Scott? I do. I do. I, I've known an awful lot of guys who made it into that cow boss position, but it was just because of, you know, the good old boys club or mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it. And they had really had no right to be in that position. Or, you know, they had credentials, like they went to college or something like that. Right. Which I don't have anything against going to college. I went to college. Yeah. But it, it didn't make me a better hand. It didn't make me a better cowman than the next guy. All it did was gave me that. Oh, yeah. I went to school. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, so, yeah, like I, I came in uh, as a manager trainee in the feedlot. And, and I can tell you, I was 25 years old when I when I took over one of the horse barns. So like at the the feed yard I was at, it was, uh, it was 120,000 head and we had two different horse barns and each, each barn had, uh, eight, eight pin riders. And, and they put me in charge of one of those when I was 25, just out of high school or not out of high school, but out of college. Uh, and, and I knew a little bit, not much, but I knew a little bit. And, and I will say I was handier than about about sixty percent of those guys, mm-hmm. but that forty percent that was older than me and I wasn't or I was handier than they didn't take very kindly to it, and uh even though I was handier than they were, they'd been around the cowboy world a lot more, and they they knew how to make me look like an asshole. And they did a good job of it. <laughs> I mean, they they did a damn good job of it. And I didn't know quite how to handle that. I know. I, so, you know, like I said, there there's a fine line you walk once once you once you step up into that cow boss role. And if you don't know how to play it, you don't last long. Yeah, it's, it's tough sometimes. I think there's some guys that have been in there a long time. And they've earned that position. Yep. But I, I do. They prove right out of the gym, right out of the gate, that they don't deserve to be there and that they don't know their shit. And that, that bugs me. And it's, yep. it's bugged me ever since I was 25 years old. Yep. And still to this day, I keep seeing kids get made into the boss. And I'm like, man. And then the manager. <laughs> yeah. And 
Well, you know, the thing. <laughs> Act like he's, you know. Oh, go, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, but, you know, finish your thought. Finish your thought there. I was just going to say that sometimes those guys need to just say, you know what? I don't think I'm quite ready for this, but they don't. They don't no. ever just say, no, I don't know. I don't think I can do it. They just keep on keeping on, you know, and pushing through and guys get quit, you know, get to quitting and leaving and the manager leaves them in there. It's like just a cluster fuck. Yeah. <laughs> like, why can't you guys figure out that you need to hire somebody and tell them, look, I need a cow boss and I need you to man up and do the job. Whether you think you're, too old or too lazy or whatever. You, I'm going to put a crew of kids under you that I need to learn how to work. Mm-hmm. And they, I don't know why they just keep making these kids boss. I'm like, shit. What happened to good old fashioned Merv Tankus types? You know? Yeah. They just kick your ass and tell you to keep going. Yeah. Call you, call you a pussy and say, look, get your shit together. You're a cowboy. You know? Yeah. Well, I know, I know one of the things that I learned, and I won't say that it, it, uh, I won't say that it won me over or that I won the crew over, but it helped. Is, and, and oh, this, this, this deal was not my fault by any means. And, Cause I, I looked at it from multiple angles and I got my ass chewed. I got, I got rode up, I don't know how many different times, and I knew the guy that caused it. And uh, what I did was I took the blame for the whole deal. I, I took the ride up. I got demoted over the deal. But mm-hmm. I, I, went and, I went and found this old fella, and I said, hey, I need to talk to you right now. And he said, uh, if you want to talk to me, you can talk to me in front of everybody. And I said, well, I don't think you want to do that. And I'll, I'll say it right now because I don't, I don't care about this guy anymore. But I said, Donnie, if you want me to talk to you in front of everybody, you're not going to come out ahead. I promise you. But let's go to lunch. I'll buy your lunch and let's have a talk. And he said, no. I brought my own lunch. I said, all right, fine then, Donnie. This was your section. You told me the wrong count. I counted the right count and I asked you to confirm. And you didn't, you confirmed the wrong count. And I took a demotion on this. I'm I'm getting like a, I forget what it was, but I took a pay cut over that deal. And I laid it out in front of everybody. And I said, if you want my job, I'll I'll, uh, I'll put in for you right now. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a recommendation. Um, but by the way, I know this trick and I know more than you now. So keep that in mind. And uh, yeah, I had uh, five different cowboys buy me beer at the bar at, uh, after work that day. So I want them over. But it was a like it was drawn a hard line in the sand. Yeah, I mean, it, but he put one over on me, and I and I, but I acknowledged it. Like, hey, yeah, you, you got me. I'm, I'm the young kid, and I I took my lickings, but I'm not gonna let you do that shit again. I promise you that. Yeah, I mean, you you had to grow up fast over that deal, in you know, in not so many words, mm. but. uh you know, I've seen an awful lot of these kids that they're in that position, and instead of instead of really moving ahead quickly, they just feel overwhelmed the whole time. Yep. And instead of becoming better, they just they just keep doing the same thing that they've been doing, and it's the status quo. But they, and they don't they don't realize that they're held to a higher standard. Right. You know, you you don't go home before everybody else. Right. Ever. No, that's that, a, that's the biggest no no of a boss. That's know? that's the thing is uh I yeah, you know, and there's there's times like even today, like I've got a guy that works for me and I'll I'll clock out before him but 
at the same time, he's talking, talking with somebody at the office. And I was like, all right, I, I'm not waiting for you to get done talking. I'm going to clock out. But I'm like, hey, we're done for the day. Like, I'll let him know we're done. And I'm, yeah. go, I'm going home. You know, right. So like, I, I don't, I don't care about when, when the time is punched. I just let him know like, Hey, we're, we're done for the day. And, and he um, also, he also does a good job of like, Hey, are we, you know, checking before he leaves? Like, are, are we, you know, are we good? Yeah, we're good. Let's go. Um, right. but there, there's that point where like, if you're the boss, it's, it's the old Truman deal. Harry Truman, you know, had that, that sign on his desk, the buck stops here. And that that's true. When you're the boss, doesn't matter how bad your crew fucked up. You're in charge of that crew. So if the crew fucked up, you fucked up. So right. you you take that ass chewing, but you get to you get to let that shit roll downhill too. If if it was not your fault. Uh, that's something that you know, for me, when I've been in any kind of position where I had people that I was responsible for. That was the biggest thing to me was that I am responsible for this situation. Yep. It's my fault. Yep. And if something went haywire, it was me. And yep. even as a just as a cowboy, I'm still that same guy, you know. Yeah. I don't want to say, well this happened or that happened and and so I didn't get it done because of this. It's like, hey, this is the reality. I fucked up. Maybe I didn't get out there early enough. Right. Maybe I should have been out there at six thirty instead of seven. Yeah. You know, or vice versa. Maybe I I chose the wrong horse. Yeah. And now I'm I'm riding something that I can't get the job done on. And so, or shit, it's my fault. I made the bad decision. Right. Know? Or or this guy picked out a horse that he shouldn't have. And, uh, yeah. and I allowed that to happen either way, you know, like it, it all, it all falls on your shoulders. If you're in charge. Yeah. And that, there's things from, I mean, that like, that's, that's just how it goes. Like if you're in charge, doesn't matter how bad the crew fucked up, whether it was your fault or not, they're your crew. So if they fucked up, you fucked up and you, you take right. that ass chewing and you can, you can, <laughs> You can go down the line with it once you take your ass chewing, but you better take your ass chewing first. Right. Well, and there's times too where you have to look at it and go, well, was it my cowboy's fault? You know, and I've seen cow bosses that try to put it off on cowboys and mm-hmm. it wasn't. Yep. Yeah, that kind of guy, don't, even though they've got that responsibility, they don't want to take it. They want to say, "Well, it was somebody else's fuck up when it was their own." That I, I don't know. I don't let that slide very well. Just like what you're saying, it's like you need to bring it. Needs to be out on the table. People yep. need to know that you fucked up. But on work ethic, and maybe that's the thing that bothered me the worst about some of these younger guys. Is I don't see the work ethic that I put in, mm-hmm. and I'm like, man, it ain't that hard to just say, you know what? Let's stay here and make sure things get done. Yeah, and and two, you know, if say I owned a a ranch, and I turned guys over to taking care of that ranch, and I stepped away from it for maybe two weeks. And when I came back, I didn't make sure everything was going good. I just trusted that them guys were making things go. Well, Matt, if them guys are fucking up and I don't know it, who's at fault? Right. Well, I am, you know. Yep. So to me, a good boss needs to be going, you know what? I need to go around and be paying attention and know what's going on. Mm-hmm. Not worried about, you know, well, I got to make it over here to get my hair cut. And I got to go get measured for a pair of new boots, you know. And, yeah, and you, got, you got to make a, an appearance in town or whatever. No, you got to make sure your ranch is running right. And that doesn't mean you have to micromanage them. But, like, if something's not working and you know it's not going to work, be like, hey, we need to change this. Right. Because, exactly. You need, you need to see what's going on. Because if they, if they don't know that it's not going to work, they're not going to know until it's too late. 
Right. So tell them beforehand. And that's, I mean, that's just part of being the, being the boss, you know, it's, it's one of those things, but like, no, I, like I said, going back to it, like once, once you make that step up to cow boss, you're not really one of the guys anymore. Like there, there's, there's a few guys that can walk that line, but there's, I mean, there's a distinct difference there. Cause there, right. there's a, there's a whole nother level of responsibility and a lot of guys don't know how to handle it. And I'm not saying I know how to handle it. And I, I've tried my best to, to play that line, but boy, I tell you what, that it's kept me up at night more than I care to admit. And I think from everything that I know about you, Matt, you're the kind of guy that cares about the fine details. I try to. I really do. You get get a lot deeper into the situation. And I think that's what makes good bosses, too, is somebody who really does care about how (laughs) our Melanie's over here on her phone. (laughs) Sorry about that. Shut up, Melanie. (laughs) Anyways, so that's something that uh, I guess to me is imperative as these guys are paying attention to what's going on. Yeah, oh, I, I think they, you're right. They, they do care about, you know, what is the bottom line here? Well, and, like you said, you're, you're responsible for all those guys. And so like, if, if you're not, if you're not paying attention there, like you said, the, a guy could rope out the wrong horse. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't have that situation on the, on the feedlot, but like where, where you're at on the, on a big ranch where, the cow boss ropes out the horses every morning and, and somebody calls out, I want that horse. And, and you know, he can't handle that horse and you rope it for him anyways. Yeah. It might be funny when he gets bucked off his head until he can't move anymore. You know, like uh, at what point that, I mean, that, that shit falls back on you and, and yeah, should he, should he have rode that horse out? Probably. But he didn't, and you roped it out for him. I mean, uh, uh, like those are the 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 type of decisions that you got to make. And uh, and so, so I'll, I'll tell you how it usually goes, Matt. It usually goes about like this: is you got a kid that you hired, uh-huh. and he says he can do the job, and uh, go out there, and you you cut him horses that are. They're maybe not the fanciest horses, but they're horses that you can get it done on. Mm-hmm. And you look over and this kid spurring on this horse and picking a fight with him pretty quick. The horse is hopping around trying to buck. And the horse ain't a bucking horse. Yeah. Okay. And that's, that's usually what you run into is kids trying to get horses to buck. Yep. Or, or even guys who are about halfway hands trying to get horses to buck. And so they're ruining good horses. So what you do is the next day you cut them out a horse that really is a bucking horse. And then the son of a bitch piles them on their head. And it's what they wanted. Yep. (laughs) You know, it's really what they were asking for. But they really couldn't handle it. I mean, it wasn't the worst. You know, it's not some kind of man killer. It's not something that's going to stomp them to death. But it's something something that can actually buck. Yeah. And now, you know, the kid's like, whoa. And that's usually the way it goes with a cow boss position where, where I've been anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, I did myself. I've been cut horses that I thought were too advanced for me as far as cranky goes. But, uh, I had my cow boss tell me months later, he's like, I knew you could handle them horses. He said, I just cut you a little bit ranker horses all the time. And, and as I could see that you were handling them and getting along with them, I'd cut you something a little bit worse and a little bit worse, and you'd get along with them. So I just kept, you know, up in the caliber of horses. And you're just and, like, uh, oh, gee, thanks, boss. That yeah, makes, that's, makes me feel great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he cut me a horse one time that they said he had bucked off eight guys in a row one day. And I and two of them guys climbed on him twice and all of them got piled right by him he's like you just got by him <laughs> 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 I 
six? You know, trying to kill me? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I'll guarantee it wasn't for lack of trying that I stayed on that horse. I mean, it was, I was assholes and elbows and every jump, my ass was out of the saddle split, you know. Yeah. But, uh, I managed to, <laughs> to get by him, beg, borrow and stole my way past him. But, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I learned from my cow boss. And he did have a lot of experience. Yeah. Um, there were guys that hated him because of his personality. And some guys hated him because he didn't do things just the way they thought they ought to. But over time, I started to realize, you know, there's a lot of things I really liked about it. Yeah. And uh, I, I got more and more respect for him over the years after I started to realize you know, he really was a pretty good cow boss. Yeah. He maybe wasn't what I thought he should be. But on the other hand, I look back at the bosses I've had, and he was a better boss than 90% of the guys out there. Yeah. There was a handful of guys that, I mean, they were the boss because they were old and they had a lot of experience. Like in a weld shop, yep. a couple of my bosses were just old weld hands, you know. Lazier than the day is long, you know. Do nothing all day but walk around and bullshit with everybody. Oh yeah, I was never impressed with those kind of guys, but they weren't cowmen, you know. Mm-hmm. They were weldmen. They were old metallurgists, you know. <laughs> but uh, gosh dang, there's some of these guys that were bosses that man, they were they were a hand, you know. Like uh, trying to think of the, the old mining boss that I had. Not a very old guy. As a matter of fact, I think he's about the same age as I am. But it didn't matter what piece of equipment they put him on, he was good at it. Yeah. And uh, that's how he became the boss was because he was good at everything he did. Mm. And he was good at mining, you know. He'd been around a lot of them old miners, and he knew how it was done. And that's why he was the boss. But I, I see these guys, they make into cow bosses sometimes, and I'm like, you know, just because he's been here for three months longer than everybody else doesn't mean mean that he has enough experience to run a crew. So that kind of stuff kind of bugged me, and I guess it should. But I, I still think to myself, okay, there's going to be guys come along who really are hands, and they've only been there a short time, and they do need to perform the balls because they got the experience. You know, like like old Tom Hudson that that Aaron Martinez is with. Tom was at that Scott Ranch a lot less time than I was. But it was apparent within just a a few days that this guy knew his shit, you know. And uh, he was an old hand. He knew his stuff way more than anybody else there did. Yeah. They had a kid who was kind of his boss. He was just a young kid, never worked anywhere, and he'd never proven himself to be a hand. And it wasn't long before old, old Tom had to put him in his place, you know. And I remember it made, made the kid cry, you know. <laughs> I was oh, my, shit. I was like, dang. But, you know, Tom just kind of had to tell it to him tough, you know, and, and say, look, it might read that way in a book, but that isn't the way it always works. You can you can do certain things a certain way on a small place, but when it gets onto these bigger outfits, it doesn't work the same way. Yeah. But uh, that's one of those times that the guy who needed to be the boss shortly was made the boss. And uh, I think that I think Jim appreciated Tom a lot. You know, he he helped that outfit a bunch. I'm I'm sure they probably miss him to this day. But yeah, I imagine so. I only talked to Tom once, but yeah, like you said, he just from the little that I talked to him, you could tell like that that's a that's a real hand. Like oh, yeah. there was no, and I've never seen him work. Uh I've, I've never I've seen a few pictures of him and whatnot, but and I've never met him in person, but just on the Zoom call, just just the way he he carried himself, and the fact that uh, Aaron's with him, I was like, ah, 
that that's a handy son of a bitch. I, I can tell that right away. Well, you know, it wasn't all. Well, let's put it this way. Um, one day we were he and I were talking about good hands, and uh, you know, as far as health goes, we were discussing a couple of guys that he and I. I thought he would know him. And I asked him if he ever knew the guy. And it's like, no, he says, I've never, never even heard of him. And I said, you know what? It's kind of funny. I see him in books and everybody in my family knows him because they grew up with him. And I said, you know what? Nobody ever talked about how he stood out as a horseman or a cowman or anything like that. And he says, you know, Scott, he says, it's not always about being the handiest guy. He says a lot of times it's the guy that shows up to work every day. He yeah. puts in a day's work day after day after day. He said that is hard to come by. Yep. He said there's a lot of guys that can rope really good. And there's an awful lot of guys who can ride a bucking horse. And he said at the end of the day, what if they don't show up? Yep. You know, what good are they? Right. He said maybe that's why Ricky was – was considered good help is because he just kept showing up and showing up. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, you got a point. And after that, that, that changed my life right there. Yeah. I decided, you know, I'm not always the handiest roper around. I damn sure miss as much as anybody. Yeah. And I'm the best horseman. Cause I've tried. I mean, I've, I've put in my time working for horse trainers and, you know, trying to figure out if I could be Mr. Super Trainer guy. And I, I couldn't cut it. I couldn't beat on them horses. I couldn't tune on them all day. Yeah. I couldn't ride the circles. You know, I got bored. And riding feed yard pens, I mean, I burn out fast. I, I do okay for about four months. And then I'm like, gosh, dang, this is boring shit, you know? Yeah. Day after day riding through the shit, day after day looking at fat cattle and you know, it just gets old after a while. I'm kind of like them horses. You know how feed yard horses get burnt out. Get, so I, I'm get sour. Yep. yep. Yeah. And I think cowboys get sour from it. No, I think so I, right. can't say, I can't say that I'm any kind of super hand, you know. I'm not, I'm not that guy. But when I'm showing up to work, I'm there. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I'm supposed to be there every day. And I try to make sure I show up every day. Yep. Day after day, just like Tom said. And it made me a better person. Yeah. You know, just that discipline. But then, too, gosh dang, Matt, this last year, all the family stuff that we've had going on and happened to bounce and go on to something different. And then thinking there was a great opportunity and bounce and do another one. The opportunity was shit, so it bounced to another one. I feel like a fucking fart movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? This deal here, even though it ain't pretty, even though it ain't all straight up cowboy, I'm like, you know what? By then, I'm going to stay here until the job's done. There you go. And so even if it goes to shit, even if these guys try to run me off, I'm staying I'm staying until we get all the cattle shipped. There you go. And uh, if I'm still there after that, fantastic. But I, I, I know this thing's kind of seasonal. But that's kind of the decision I made, so I'm gonna stick her out. You know. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's. Uh, you know, I think that's that's part of it. Is like when when you give your word, you give your word. You know. Yep. And. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I just I, I think um, we'll, we'll kind of end it on that. But like like we were talking uh, earlier in the show, like there's 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 some reason that that Boots O'Neill has become a legend in the cowboy world, and that's because he's just cowboyed every day since uh, 1946 or something like that. You know, outside of a few years in the in the army and the few years as a brand inspector, he showed up before before uh, sun up, had a horse saddled, sat down, and ate breakfast, and then rode out 
whether it be the big circle or the, the you know the inside circle or the outside circle, doesn't matter. Um, yeah. And I talked to him today, and he sounded tired, like just he sounded wore out. But guess what? He's going to go saddle a horse tomorrow, and he's 89 years old. Right. And uh, if that ain't cowboy, I don't know what is. Right. That's exactly right. I just, you know. That's a life well lived right there. Well, I think so. I, I think so. And, uh, you know, and. And, you know, and he's, he's told me many times, like he, he's got enough, he's got a good enough retirement where he can, he can move to town at any point and, and live comfortably, but he likes watching him run the horses in, in the morning. And he likes sitting out on the porch and, and I've sat out there with him in the evenings. Uh, you know, there was one evening where I got to sit out there and just visit with him, uh, on the porch of the four sixes. And it's, it's peaceful as hell. And, uh, if you're in town, you don't get that view. And, uh, I don't know. It it just, there's, there's a reason why everybody knows the name Boots O'Neill. And, uh, it's because he's just, He's been a sure enough cowboy his whole life. And uh, I think that's what we all try to be. Just whether we want a cowboy till we're 80 or nine. I, I mean, I don't think I do, but to be a hundred percent honest with you, I don't, I don't know if I, if I want to do that, but I want to, like I, I strive to be that level of integrity every day. So. Yeah, that's, there's, there's a lot to be said for that. I yeah, mean, we can go. We can go on about integrity and the the depth of a person's soul. We can go on and on about that. We'll do that another time for sure. We will. Well, hey man, I appreciate your time, Matt. Oh man, I sure have, I have fun visiting with you. I, I do too. I, I I sure enjoy it. Like I, I I've and when I say that it does. Like, you know, like we, we, we hit it off pretty much right away. And I, I don't know for whatever reason we did, but I, I'm sure glad we did because I, I consider you one of my buddies and you're, you're another guy that I've never met in person. But I, like I said, when, when, when I know you're calling, I, I better have an hour to talk to you. Otherwise I don't want, I don't even want to uh, undertake it because like, uh, we got to have an hour. We got to have an hour. Absolutely. Well, Hey man, I, I had a lot of fun talking to you tonight. I I sure appreciate you. Yeah, you better get to bed. You got to get up early in the morning. So yeah, three's gonna hit way before I want to. <laughs> All right, Scott. Um, well, you take care. You too, man. Uh, good good visiting with you. You rise up in the morning beneath the stars so bright. Pull your hat down, make sure your cinch is tight. Horse is kinda snuffy, cold chill up your spine. You'll get your ass moving some more burning daylight. Get your ass moving sun, you're burning daylight.